Welcome to the Fast Track Entrepreneur Podcast with your host, Tara Bowman. You are about to get filled with business strategies, advice, and motivation to get you prepared to fast track your five year plan in less than one year. So buckle up and let's create your first class business with clarity and confidence. So welcome to the Business Upgrade Podcast. I am so excited for today's guest. You are going to be blown away by this brainchild of book writing. I love, love, love this woman. Not only have I had the chance to work with her on the client side, I've also been a client of hers as well. So let me introduce you to Dr. Cindy Childress. She is a ghostwriter and book editor for coaches and consultants that go on to achieve Amazon bestseller status, book TED Talks, build catching businesses, and creates nonprofits. She developed her Write My Book Blueprint framework to create reading experiences that encourages reviews and word of mouth and turns readers into lifelong fans of the author. She'll teach this curriculum at her Write Your Bestseller Retreat in Paris, Cindy holds a Ph.D. in English, teaches creative writing classes at WriteSpace in Houston, Texas, and is a foster mom with Citizens for Animal Protection in Houston as well. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Cindy. Hi, Cindy. Hello. Thank you, Tara. What a lovely introduction. Oh, yeah. Sometimes it's nice just to sit back and listen and take that all in, right? Like, is that me? (laughs) I love it. I love it. So first thing I want to start off with is where are you now when we're doing this interview? I'm just, I like to always find out. Are you in a home office? Are you on vacation? Where are you? Here. I'm at WeWork in the small office that I rent here. It's a co-working space in Houston in the Galleria area. Um, It's also very dangerous because to get to the food court, I have to walk by Chanel every day. (laughs) Right? I could, but that also is a motivator for you to like work harder, I would imagine. So I love that. It's something we definitely have in common. We have this probably very unhealthy <laughs> likeness of Chanel. So yes, I love that. So cool. So we work for people who don't know is, is a co-working company that has these really great creative, super cool spaces all over the world. And you pay a monthly fee, and you can either do the co-working, which is a great way to meet other entrepreneurs, or you can have a dedicated office. So happy to uh, know that that's where you are. So all right. So let's. I want to just jump in. So you are a ghostwriter. Can you explain to people, like, what does that mean? I mean, they may have heard of it, but what does it really mean? Yes, I love this question because every now and then people think that means I write scary stories. Um, (laughs) But actually being a ghostwriter means that I write your book for you and then you publish it under your own name as the author. So I take your intellectual property, whether that's your experience, information, stories, ideas, And then I put it into the paragraphs and the chapters and all the neat bullet points and exercises that you want to include. And then I step away and you're on the the spotlight as the author. I love that. I love that. That's so cool. So, yeah, I mean, what percentage would you say of books out there, like these best-selling books, like the ones that everyone's reading or everyone knows about, what percentage would you say have some ghostwriting element to it? You know, I haven't seen an exact statistic, but it's so big that um, it's just pretty much most of them. I mean, you can generally expect that in nonfiction particularly, a lot of like Stephen King writes his own stuff, so <laughs> I don't want to misrepresent, you know, all best-selling authors. Right. But definitely, you know, when you walk into Barnes & Noble and you see the table and, you know, some famous celebrity has a cookbook and some famous celebrity has, you know, an an autobiography, they contributed to it. It's their ideas. I, you know, I believe that there's integrity in the publishing world, but also, you know, they probably had help because it's not a good use of their time to learn how to write a book when they're too busy, you know, running their empires. And I love that. And thank you for clarifying that because that was something I know, you know, when just even as a business coach myself, it's like, you know, that's something you struggle with is, okay, if you hire someone to do it, what if it's not really your ideas? And is it really, like, how does that 
play into what you said, integrity. And it sounds like even if they're not the ones physically writing and copy and editing every word, like it's still their idea and concepts. And a good ghostwriter knows how to take their ideas and put it into their stories and their just so that it does, it is them. So we're all busy. I get it. That's kind of what is so beautiful about ghostwriters. And it's, it's such a hidden industry, right? Where it's like, they're called a ghost for a reason. Um, <laughs> and, but there's no shame in that. It's actually a really smart business move to, to make. I, I would see that that way. So very, very cool. Thank you for clarifying that for us for sure. One thing I wanted to ask you is, what is the difference between people who come up to you? Because as soon as you say, and I've, I've had the privilege, we live in the same town, so we go to some of the same events, and I've seen this happen to you, right? As soon as you say, oh, I'm a ghostwriter, and this is what I do, people will flood to you and say, tell you about how they want to write a book. They want to write a book. I, you know, I'm gonna. I'm gonna write a book. I want to. Everyone tells me I should write a book. Like, I've seen it a million different ways. And then what's the difference between that person versus the person that actually does publish a book? And I'll say publish a book because they don't have to write it. They just have to work through it on the publishing side, right? So what's the difference between the person who says, I'm going to, or everyone tells me, or I want to, versus actually having it be on an Amazon bestseller? Yes, that is a super question. I think the biggest difference between people who are they say they want to do it, but it's maybe someday or accept or not until. There's something blocking them that's, you know, sometimes they there's something they actually need to learn. Maybe they feel ill-equipped to write an expert book on that topic because it interests them, but they don't feel like they're an expert. And maybe it's actually true that they should do some more educating of themselves and delve a little deeper into what's already written on that topic so that they are confident that they know where they can carve some space with their own ideas and their own little niche. So it's not always a bad thing to have your own book on hold, but what's different between that and someone who is ready to go is it all depends on being clear on the outcome that you want when you are an author. So if you know when you want to have your book in hand, um, and I'm working with a lady right now who has purchased a booth at a large medical conference in Dallas, and she needs her book on her table so she can sell it. And, you know, looking at that kind of deadline and that pressure, you know, it's immediate. She's met every single one of my deadlines to her way ahead of time so that we can move the project along as quickly as possible so she can have what she needs when she needs it. So it doesn't always have to be that soon. It's better if you can have a little more time. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But the important thing is to know what you want as a result because that's going to motivate you to do the work. Even if you're working with a ghostwriter, you do have to make your appointments to give me your intellectual property. I do that through recorded interviews because I assume you want to work with me because you don't want to do more writing. You want to do less. Um, So we just have conversations and I take notes from those. But, you know, if you're not willing to make the time to do those conversations, then the outcome of having your book is not as important to you now as it may be at some time in the future. I love that. So, and, and just to you know, I'm a very transparent person. It's like I, when I hired Cindy to help me get clarity on on what book I wanted to write, because I've written a book in the past that I was for sure thought was going to be on the New York bestsellers list. And oh my gosh, like, you know, I went down the route where, you know, I didn't have any fear around publishing this book and this and this and that. But then, you know, launch day, I sold like five copies, three went to my mom, one went to an aunt who I hadn't talked to. So it was like, I didn't, you know, back then, this was, wow, like 12 years ago, I didn't know that really with a book like that, you had to have a business model around it, and, you know, you don't just always get super rich just selling your book, and, you know, I had a lot to learn from myself. So when I knew I wanted to write the next book, it needed to be done right. So, of course, I hired Dr. Cindy, and I was like, okay, help me flush out the ideas here, because there's a lot in my head, (laughs) and how do I get this out in a way that does have a very clear topic and has those outcomes that I that I want that I understand now that I understand marketing and and serving and and whatnot a lot better so what was great about it is 
she just asks you questions and you just talk. So we'll talk a little bit about your process, which I think is, is genius. And it wasn't scary. It wasn't overwhelming. It was simply you asking me very pointed questions. I would answer them and then you would return it back to me in a way that sounded like even way better. Like it was really the coolest thing. And then she helped me put together an outline so that I can stay on track when I'm writing and whatnot. So, um, and in that case, you know, but when she's ghostwriting for somebody, like the lady she was saying uh, in Dallas, it's like, it's probably more of a, I would imagine, a series of interviews. Yes. I usually get, well, depending on how long your book is going to be, um, between 22 and 28 hours of recorded mm-hmm. interviews. Wow. So I do them in two-hour chunks. And I have the interview questions that I write based on the table of contents that we've agreed on from the beginning. And then in each session, I'm able to ask questions that cover uh, usually three to four of the chapters that we've planned. And so that's how we get through the content. So you're transferring your ideas to me. And then I have a developmental edit process. So then I take you through the editing processes of a book. And I think that's one thing that differentiates me from some ghostwriters that just take your ideas, get you a messy first draft, and then um, hand you off to another book editor. Because with my background with the PhD in English, I'm perfectly capable of then editing your book. And since I'm so familiar with the topic, I'm the best person to do it. Because (laughs) I remember that what's on page 80 matches up with what's on page 30. Mm. And, you know, someone new to the process would have to go in and relearn all of that. So um, I do developmental um, copy and line editing. And then I have a peer from graduate school who does the proofreading. Because if I've made my own common mistakes on your draft, I'm not the best person to see them and make them. Right, exactly. Oh, I love that. So it's just a much more efficient process uh, to when you take it from concept to book cover published, right? So, like, I love that. That's so cool. So one thing that comes to mind is a lot of, you know, I primarily, you know, work with women. This podcast is for women. Women have a tend, if they're going to write a book, they have a lot of different ideas for all kinds of different books. Like, you know, based on it may be something – that they want to share that was a childhood experience or a life experience, but they also maybe run a business and they think, oh, I could have a book that helps market my business. Or maybe I just am a, I love writing mysteries and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So how do you, if someone has all these book ideas in their head, how do you help them hone in on picking one? Definitely. Well, the first thing I would do is just say, tell me about your ideas. And usually there's one that just they brighten up and they're more passionate and excited about it. And then some of the other ones, when they tell me about it, it's like they're pulling teeth. They're like, oh, yeah, and this one, everybody tells me I ought to write about that. But you can just tell they're like, they're not yeah. excited about it. Um, right. And then I'll take you through a process of thinking about, okay, for the audience that you already have now, what – content are they um, consuming from you and what content do they want because Mm -hmm. those would be your first buyers when you were going to go to release your book yeah and another thing we think about um, I heard this um, Tara and I were at traffic and conversion last year um, at Brendan Burchard's talk and one thing he also said about books is whatever topic you choose you're going to have to talk about it for three years (laughs) really love it. <laughs> yes. And you know what is such an aha from that? And I say that with people who come to me for women who have, you know, their business model or they want to shift it because they may have created an entire business platform on some traumatic experience that they're just mm-hmm. sick of talking about. Like they're just over it. And I would imagine a book is the same way. So that's a great way to differentiate. Do you really want to write that book? You know, or do you want to write this book? Mm-hmm. Ah, that's good. That's good. Love that. So for the for the people who are listening, which if they're listening, you, you have some, someone has told you, you should write a book or you just have that personal desire. For me as a, you know, a high schooler, I always loved to read. It started with my Sweet Valley Twins, you know, mm-hmm. every collection at, I think it was, was it Walden Books or Wal, something, I would oh, go to the mall. Yes. yes. And it was, you know, every week when they would release a new Sweet Valley Twins. 
I had to have them in order, and I would have these collections, um, and I loved that, the series and, and whatnot. And that's really what started my obsession with reading. And who is your favorite twin? I really related more to Jessica than Elizabeth. <laughs> Me too. I always felt so guilty because Elizabeth was like the nerdy one, and I thought I probably yeah. am more like her. Right. But Jessica. <laughs> But we wanted to live vicariously through Jessica driving her. And then when it went to Sweet Valley High, when they got into high school, then it was like she had the convertible and, the, and you know, and it was like, I think it was, it's brilliantly written now when you look back at it because it was like, of course, they were writing for the Elizabeths who were like us with our nose in a book, but because we really wanted to know what it was like to be the Jessica. Yes. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's brilliant. So, yeah, so that's what started my love of books, right? And then, uh, you know, I did well in English, and it just was one of those things that as a consumer, I love to always be learning, just like everyone else, right? Um, and that desire to learn, so I'm always reading new books, and now there's audio books and so many cool ways to get information. And so it just, to me, became like a thing of like, well, why couldn't I write a book? And And I think, for most people, there's either someone tells you that you're a great writer or you have a great story, you should write a book, versus, and the people who just have that, I want to be an author. I want to be able to say, I wrote something, put it out in the world, and it's, guess what, when I'm long and gone, my great, great grandkids someday can go to Amazon or whatever's, I'm sure the tech will be so different back then, and just be able to have something and be like, man, that's cool. That was something my great-great-grandmother wrote, you know, to leave out in the world. So, so yeah, I just think it's, um, it's good to understand probably the why you want to write a book, right, um, as well as, you know, how you're going to get it done. So for those people who just have that feeling, like I either want to write a book, someone tells me should, I should, I want to do it for my business, I want to serve the world, whatever your, your why is, What's the, what's the best way that they should get started to write the book? Yes. Um, I meet a lot of people who, because I'm a ghostwriter, they know that means I start and finish a lot of books. Right, right. <laughs> so um, one thing that I offer is fairy godmother editing. Mm -hmm. And I started doing that because I had a client, we did the table of contents, and a lot of people, just like Tara, they, once they have their ideas organized, they're ready to go. You know, they're already a talented writer, but just this is so much content to put together. They need some extra help there. Um, but this lady, I did that for her. She did not want me to go strike. She really wanted to write her own book, but she wouldn't get off the phone with me. So I was trying mm. to finish the conversation and be like, so best of luck. You can do it. <laughs> and she just wouldn't hang up. And so then finally I said, well, here's an idea. What if I write the questions as if I was going to interview you but then you write your answers, so you are mm -hmm. physically writing your book, but you've got all that extra help. So, you know, ostensibly you should never have writer's block because you should be able to answer all the questions. So then you're just writing answers to questions, and then I put in your neat headlines and make everything pretty with the editing. And she was like, wow, that is exactly what I want. <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, and that's called fairy godmother editing, right? I love Very that. And, yes. <laughs> she can come and, in and be that. That's so cool. And, you know, the thing is you can do that for yourself too. And that was one of the ideas that I'd given to Tara when we finished her um, table of contents process. And as I mentioned earlier, she had a plan. So what's the writing plan? So that was based on the word count that she was targeting for the book for the length that she would like it to be. So when she sells it and people have it in their hand, they feel like they got, you know, the fifteen ninety nine that they paid. <laughs> The values there, and um, then we reverse engineered that to think roughly how long each chapter should be, and then within each chapter there are subsections. So when you know your total book length by the word count, and then you're dividing that by the chapters, and then you can think, okay, so roughly each subsection should be, let's say, 300 words long. That's like as long as a short blog, mm -hmm. and then you're, you've got that self-discipline, so you know when you've got enough, and you know when you don't have enough then you can really project manage your own book writing. I love, I love that. I love that. And that's so true because it, it's as soon as you sit down, there is no writer's block because you are very clear with this is what I need to be writing about. And here's the flow that it, it, it just, I've started writing it. And I'll tell you, you have just been literally a fairy godmother in my life about that. So <laughs> thank you for that. That's so good. So if you want to get started, I mean, it's just a matter of getting really clear on, uh, you know, what 
you want your the topic of your book. You know, if you if you can't hire Cindy, right? Like, just start with that table of contents. That's going to give you clarity. Uh, so that that's huge. It's huge because you know sometimes the blinking cursor of like uh, I have to produce three hundred pages. Like, how am I going to do that? And where do I start? But you know, step one, you know, table of contents. That's really really a, a great idea. Um, let me ask you a question. I'm going to kind of segue a little bit here about uh, sometimes when I meet people, especially clients or, you know, just women who have uh, just businesses, obviously I'm, I'm around a lot of women entrepreneurs. It's like they may have a book that they feel like they need to write for themselves. Like they need to write it for themselves, for healing, for what mm -hmm. have you, right? Versus writing for a reader, what the reader wants to hear. What's your take on that? This is such a rich question because the first thing that I will usually say, and I have a client who came to me with a really complex, very personal story, um, and I told her, you know, why don't you just write it for yourself? Just, you know, put your ideas down onto paper so you can even see what what you believe happened and what your perspective is on the events and how you feel and how it affected you later. So, and then we're going to look at that and decide, okay, so what are you comfortable or what do you think ought to be shared with the world and what do you think you just needed to put on paper for yourself? And when you think about these tell-all memoir writers, and there are a plenty, one that comes to mind that's a best-selling one um, on the shelf these days is Glennon Doyle. Mm -hmm. And when you look at her writing, it's intensely personal <laughs> and it feels like she's letting it all hang out and I mean I haven't talked to her personally I didn't see her earlier drafts but just knowing what I do about the nature of humanity in the English language for everything you choose to reveal there's something that you choose not to reveal mm. and sometimes when you even write a very shocking book what you're choosing not to reveal is like your vulnerability or your soft side right so <laughs> there, you know you have to be but when you think about writing for yourself versus publishing, publishing is about what do you feel needs to be shared with a larger audience and what are you comfortable sharing with that larger audience. And then writing for yourself is just purely self-exploration and getting to know yourself better and seeing what you really think. I love that. And that's so, so true. Like, I mean, one thing that comes to mind for me is like my stories in my first book were so different than they are in this one. And it had, if I wouldn't have, and I was, I was started writing it on the train from New York City to Boston on my family vacation. We had like a four hour train ride, I had my laptop, the kids had their snacks and whatever. And I was like, I have time. What? So and it, it's something about being in a moving, whether it's plane, I don't know if this is like a, scient a scientific thing, but like my creativity when I'm on vacation is through the roof because I actually have some downtime to actually, you know, uh, think creatively so I started writing and it just was flowing and I was laughing out loud and I was showing things to my husband who was sitting next to me like this was I a hilarious story of growing up with my dad being a lead singer of a rock band and my mom being an entrepreneur and and whatnot and it was like I feel so much more I feel so much more comfortable now telling those personal stories than I would have you know, 10 years ago, and if I wouldn't have done personal development work and had great communication with my family and whatever, you know, I would be very hesitant to put some of this stuff out there, and I would, you know, so when you had talked earlier about you got to be ready to write the book, and you got to have the timing, right, the difference between I want to write the book versus the person that actually does it, it's like timing is no accident, right? I couldn't have done that book 10 years ago without fear of my family being mad at me for sharing, like, who knows, some, you know, not really, but yet, you know, funny ways of how I saw myself growing up. So, um, you know, that is something you just have to do that work, right, before you're willing to put it all out there and really put, you know, a vulnerable book um, out there. So, but I realized... <laughs> I got to share my story in order for people to feel comfortable sharing theirs. And, you know, sometimes you might make some people mad and sometimes it might be a little uncomfortable, but you know, at the end of the day, nobody's going to die from it. So it's, it's all for the greater good. And that's to me writing for someone else, writing for my audience versus writing for me. And 
I think a lot of the times the people who want to write, for, and this is something that's also a, comes, I see this often in business, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, is people who want to start a business for, or, you know, write a book or a blog, or this is, I work with a lot of speakers. They may they want to speak about something on a topic that is really important to them. And I always say, like, that's cool, but guess what? People don't buy it when it's just about you. You have to make it about them. So if you're nervous to go give that talk and that speech and that, you know, whatever, it's like I instantly, before I go on a stage, I always say, this isn't about me, it's about them. So please download what I need in order to serve everyone in that audience today. And when I switch that mindset, oh, it's just been a game changer, right? So have you had any clients that you've had to kind of weave into, yeah, that's a great story, but let's... How can we bring that back so that readers will actually get takeaways from that? Yeah, um, I have, well, you know, it's kind of about what's the purpose of your book? So what do you want as an author at the end and how you define success? And usually what we agree on for the answer to that question is what I can refer back to. Um, I have a client who is the executive director of a nonprofit. So the purpose of the book is to explain how um, his upbringing and his business experience led him to make the amazing changes he has and had the success that he's had um, with his nonprofit. But the purpose ultimately is to get more people to donate, to get more people to volunteer, mm -hmm. and hopefully for other places to replicate the good things that he's doing. And then he gives me a fishing story and a golf story. And <laughs> they're cool stories that he enjoys telling about himself, but they don't refer back in any way to how that helps the book's mission. And so I've been able to very delicately just refer in the way I just described, and then he'll agree with me and be like, okay, it's a cool story. I'm glad that we wrote it down so I have it for my family, but right. yeah, it doesn't belong in the book on this topic. And uh, the other thing is there can be another book. You know, if you've got a story to tell that doesn't fit this book, don't feel like this is the only book you're ever going to write. I mean, with non with self-publishing these days, there's no reason if you've got it in you, you shouldn't have three, five, ten books. Yes, that's so true. I love that. I, that's, I mean, it's kind of like it's having almost like a book purpose statement. You know, and well, you got to constantly be reflecting that. Like I did a lot of work um, on my own promise late recently, and it was like everything I'm doing in my business now needs is reflected on that promise that I put out there. But it, the same thing needs to happen with the book, and that's kind of like you want to talk about the value of having a ghostwriter in your pocket. Like that alone is going to help you connect those dots because we can get squirrely like when we get writing and get off on tangents and it's her job to go yeah that's a great story we're nixing that you know this this and that this makes more sense move it here uh, and that's that's beautiful so I love that yeah. um, and quickly, I'm sorry no you're fine um, yeah I was just going to quickly share another way that you can approach that so mm -hmm. I have a client who's a life coach and she has a specific set of stories about herself that she wanted to share. And what I did is help her break those stories down and then think of exercises that she could pair with them and how those stories about herself were also teaching moments mm. and to make those turns from storytelling to teaching moment and exercise so that it wasn't just a memoir that would just make people feel like, wow, well, she's been through a lot. She's very motivational, right. but it would right. also make them think, and she can help people like me. Yes, and that is so key, and that was for me as a teacher, as an online you know, educator or whatever, is something that might, was an aha for me that I would love our listeners to understand is if you want to share your gifts and, and teach and put things out there in a book, it, a lot of the times is that too, right, it, especially mm – -hmm. Uh, the nonfiction side. So it's like what you need to do is you have to, you know, share. So i.e. teaching and sharing. But where the transformation comes is by giving some way for your reader to apply what you just shared to them. Because let's face it, like we live in a world where it's like, yeah, yeah, great story. What about me? Like, mm -hmm. you know, I always say that with women who struggle to network. They're like, what do I say? I'm like, 
you introduce yourself and you let people talk about their favorite subject in the world themselves. <laughs> and so you just flip it like, oh, great. This, I'm Tara. I'm a business coach. Tell me about what do you do? And then you can get things going from there. So it's just, um, you know, it's the nature of, of life these days. And a book is no different. So when you can apply it and write it or you want to write it and allow them to apply your lessons and your stories to their personal life, they are not going to just love your book. They're going to become a raving fan around your book. So, and that's what you want. Yeah, yeah cool. Um, to segue here, we got, I know we have a, we don't have much time left, but is, I would love to know your take on the difference between self-publishing a book versus being published by a publisher. <laughs> Sure. The, the biggest, you know, one thing that's not different between the two for an average person, not surprise the listeners, which is you still have to do a lot of your own marketing and set up your own events. If you want a speaking tour, you're going to have to do the bookings yourself for the most part. Um, if you are published by a publisher, you may get some kind of stipend, but it probably will not cover all your expenses if you want to do something mm -hmm. and really do a lot of outreach. So you're going to have to learn marketing when you have a book and consider your book as your business, whichever way you publish. The benefits of self-publishing are you can do it a lot faster. You're not in line behind a lot of other books the publisher is also working on. Um, your book is your product, whereas with publishing, the book is the publisher's product. Mm. And your brand is now part of their product as well. So that can get a little sticky too when you want to reuse the content from your book in other ways in your business. And then you can't because um, the publisher holds the rights. So I know some authors have been disappointed when they realized how that worked. So, But there are benefits of publishing with a big publisher. The main reason that a lot of people turn to self-publishing is both the time factor, you can get it out quickly. Um, you own your intellectual property still, so you own your personal brand. And then the other reason is just that for most publishers, as I understand it, if you don't have at least 20,000 followers, but really half a million would be much more preferred, <laughs> um, then you really don't have the proof of concept they're looking for for them to make a big return on the investment they would be making in your book. But that doesn't mean it's not a great idea for you because if you're selling a coaching business or an online course or you want more paid speaking engagements, then you can recoup your investment on your book, not in mm -hmm. sales, $35 right. a book, and how many of those do you have to sell, but in your upsell and list building that you can do with your book. I love that. That's such a great, I learned so much in just you sharing that. Like, I really had, I never had thought that you don't necessarily own the content. Like, and, you know, and uh, yeah, that's brilliant. Okay, love it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, one last question. I'm curious. Like, you have a PhD in English, right? And you're also a creative writer yourself. And I know you do poetry and, I mean, Dr. Cindy is multifaceted. What got you into ghostwriting specifically? Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought up poetry because um, I have a poetry collection that was just named as a finalist in the um, Washington Prize um, from WordWorks. So that is... Congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah, that makes me happy. And the way I became a ghostwriter is I started out in technical writing after taking a seven-year hiatus and going with my husband overseas. So with the seven-year work gap, we were in Malaysia and Indonesia, um, pretty much my academic career was, you know, just <laughs> not, a game, not a starter. So I had to find something else to do. And it's really cool because when I reflect on it, I remember in graduate school, my classmates would say things like, oh, I don't think I would ever survive outside academia. Um, and I've never really felt that way. And so here I am proving it. <laughs> Yay. That's awesome. That is so cool. I love it, love, love it. So we'll talk about something more lighthearted. And then I want to make sure that everyone knows um, how to get in touch with you. And I want to talk about this amazing Paris retreat that you have coming up. Oh, Paris. Love it. Uh, but before we do that, I know you're a huge animal lover. And when we were talking, actually, 
uh, Cindy and I and our husbands, we wanted to introduce them. They're both in the oil and gas business. And so we went to dinner the other day and we got talking about, you know, her rescues and, and what she does. Um, and their rescue fails. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we were talking about how she had just moved and she has a guest room that is dedicated to animals and so do you have any dogs or cats or in your in your rescue room right now well my rescue room is open for business um, we did just move houses so we have the little cat tree in there and the little dog kennel and it's got a special door that opens to a private courtyard so when we have a dog in there and they'll be able to leave themselves without having to walk through the house and meet my dog <laughs> which did not go well in our previous house um, so we don't have any right now but we recently had some foster fails so foster fails are big wins for the animals um, that was two kittens from a litter of five that I hand reared from four weeks old they were um, their mother was killed in a by a car and then they needed somebody, so I took care of them. Um, I even gave them baths with Johnson's baby soap and Aww. everything. Aww. <laughs> Every day for three weeks um, until they were big enough to groom themselves. And then two of them I just kept. Their names are Orlando and Principessa, and they now weigh over five pounds. Aww. They're five times the size they were when they came to me, and they make me so happy. Oh, those are rescue fails. Like like you said, it's great for the animals, but it's got to make it hard when you when you rescue. I mean, we have a rescue. Well, both our our dog and our cat are rescues, and it's like I swear there's something about they just know that you rescued them, and they just there's a gratefulness that just. When they look at you, you know, you're just like, oh. So, yeah, it's funny mm -hmm. how, it, especially with our rescue cat that we, she had been in, I think, three or four shelters before she even yeah. came to our house. And now she's the queen of the house. And it's very, she very much has forgotten, you know, what life was like on the streets before she came to her, uh, her palace. And so she just sits there like, I'm not going back. <laughs> Oh, I love super that. cute. Yeah, I love it. So very, very cool. So tell us about, I want to hear about, you have a, a writing retreat in Paris coming up. Tell us about that. Yes, it's going to be three full days with okay. um, a little welcome meet and greet um, the night before it starts so you can meet the other people at the event. It's going to be in Paris on the Champs-Élysées, which is the 8th arrondissement. And um, we're going to be taking you from idea to table of contents. You're going to write several chapters for your book. Uh, we'll teach you some editing tools as well. And we're going to end with an author debut when you're going to do a reading from what you have written and reveal your ideas to the world. Oh, my gosh. It sounds so dreamy. What's, so what's the real, like, benefit to travel to write versus, you know, trying to do it in your home office or in bed at night? Yes. Well, first of all, just getting out of your normal environment forces your brain to think differently. So maybe some ideas that you would kill, you give them a little bit more pause for thought. And I particularly love to write in places where English is not what I hear the most of. Because when you hear mostly, like I was just in Italy for nine days this summer to do some writing myself, and when you're just immersed in a foreign environment, you like things become crisper and more focused, and you're actually more free to be creative and expressive, and you can also do a lot more in the in a smaller amount of time because you don't have all the distractions that you would at home. So if you that. just took three days off work and stayed at home and thought you would get the same amount done, it would be very difficult. I'm right. People that can do it. Yeah, I know you'll be wanting to, like, you have to do the laundry and then all these things and distractions and emails. I, and so that is a thing. Like, it just was an aha for me of, like, when I am traveling or on a train or on a plane, I, I literally think differently. So I think the value of going to Paris is huge. When is the Paris uh, retreat? It's September 30th. That's the meet and greet the night before. And then the days of October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Ooh, okay, so perfect. Paris and the fall. Like, wow, okay. Perfect timing. Do you have any spots or is it sold out? 
At this time, I have two spots, so if anyone is interested, I would love for you to apply. I'd like to hear more about your book idea, and hopefully we will be a fit. And the website you can go to is www.bestsellerinparis.com. www.bestsellerinparis.com. Perfect. Now I'll have all kinds of good, awesome information for you to find out all the details and be able to find out, you know, like let Cindy know what your book idea is about. And so if there are still spots available, you know, I'm sure she'll get you information on that. So bestsellerinparis.com. Love that. So what if our listeners just want to get in touch with you? So this is going to be recorded. So they might be listening to this, and it's 2022, and Paris has long since <laughs> been over. What, how can our listeners get in touch with you? Sure. You can always go to my website, which is www.childresscommunication.com. And on social media, I make it super easy. My handle is at Cindy Childress PhD, and you can find me there on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Awesome. Well, Dr. Cindy, I mean, it's it's been a pleasure, and she's a source of a ridiculous amount of information. So if you've even had an inkling to want to write a book, do not miss out on learning more from her blog, which is beyond, or signing up for her newsletter and getting in touch and just having a conversation. Like so many people these days, as their business grows, and and Cindy's blessed to have a great business, but as your business grows, like less people want to have conversations with people. And Dr. Cindy's not that person. Like she will have a conversation with you, which is Mm -hmm. pretty cool and and unheard of. So definitely check out, uh, write your best, Tell me the website again. Bestsellerinparis.com. Yes. Yes. So go check that out if you want to go to Paris and make this about you and have your time to get that book out there. The first step is exactly what she said. And to be able to have an expert like her hold your hand and help you create that table of contents and flesh out the ideas. I mean, there's no better kickstart to writing your book that you've been talking about writing for a long time. So Dr. Cindy is your woman on that for sure. So before we wrap up, is there, I'd love for you to share what's the, what's the one thing you wish people knew about writing a book that they think they know, but they really don't. And if you could share that secret that if if they just knew it it might make a big difference in their lives sure I think a lot of people have the idea that their first thought is the best thought so Mm -hmm. then they're reluctant to edit or delete what's already written and then they feel like but what they want to continue writing doesn't match what they had and they really get stuck there a lot of times what you first wrote when you were first starting your book does not go in the final copy at all. So I can't tell you how many people I've met that tell me they've started writing a book and they're stuck. And I say, oh, well, tell me about it. How much have you written? And it's like three, four pages. That's very Mm. common. And it's just because they're so stuck on what they already have, they can't think past it. And I think being able to think past it is really going to open up a lot for anybody who's trying to write a book. Would you call that like their messy first draft kind of thing? Like just, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be, and you don't have to be tied to that. So that's really a good idea. I probably in hindsight should have done that with the boss and bunny slippers, my first book, uh, and, and just Mm -hmm. saw it as that (laughs) and then held on and and to write the book that I was really meant to write. So it's all good. It's all good. So anyway, so Dr. Cindy, it's been an absolute joy. So again, Dr. Cindy Childress. Uh, visit her website, follow her on social media, childresscommunication.com. And if you can make Paris happen and there's still a spot left for you, definitely go to a bestsellerinparis.com and check it out. So thank you, Dr. Cindy. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Tara. All right. (laughs) All right. Talk soon. Take care. There you have it. Another episode packed full of strategies and motivation that you can use every day to put your business on the fast track. For a podcast recap and more resources, visit TaraBowman.com. Don't forget, subscribe to the podcast and get what you need to help fast track your five-year business plan.